Hey, hello everybody, and welcome to this first question and answer animation episode thing. I am currently working on the next uh, set of episodes for the animation of video game series, but it's not done yet. They actually take a bit longer to do now, ever since Shadow of the Colossus, when I started doing the thing where I record the gameplay footage first, and then I kind of discuss it and record commentary later, and then I edit it all together. It, it takes a lot longer than it used to, but I think the episodes are better for it. All of that to say, the episodes are coming, I'm gonna probably record footage for the next set of them after this, actually. I thought in the meantime it might be fun to answer a few of your animation questions, and so I asked on Twitter and you guys gave me like 50 questions, which is way more than I have time to answer here, but I will try to answer as many as I can. Now the footage you see in the background is just be real footage stuff that I got from Jack and Daxter, and the music is a bunch of cool remixes from cool people, and I'll put links to all of them down in the text description so you should just go download all of them. Most of them are free, probably, so yeah, go do that. By the way, I apologize if my voice sounds a little funny, I have a cold. But anyway, you guys asked a lot of good questions, so let's get to a bunch of those. Hi Dan, is your name really... Dan? Okay, uh... Oh, okay, so this one... I think this question came from our Extra Credits media director, Soraya, who was helping me get the Google form set up. So I think this is from her, so... Not a real question. Let's... Moving on. Next question. Are you a co... <sighs> Soraya! Hey Dan, I really need to know, how do you accurately predict the timing and spacing in the blocking stage? Because I have trouble with that. But uh, you and me both. I am actually really bad at predicting the timing and like the frame count between uh, keyframes when blocking out animation early on. Fortunately with 3D animation it's pretty easy to kind of feel it out, like you can build all your poses and then kind of move them around in the time slider and just like kind of feel out the timing naturally, but for like a 2D animator, that's probably a little bit harder. For stop motion, it, I guess it's impossible. I don't know, stop motion animators are wizards. How do you feel about motion capture? Can it replace hand-done animation? Um, I think that motion capture is an excellent tool for specific jobs. Uh, there are a lot of animators who may feel negatively toward motion capture, uh, partly because some of them may feel that it kind of takes their jobs in a certain way, which I, I think a lot of animators are kind of over that feeling now. I think that was a more common feeling way back in the day. Now I think a lot of animators just aren't that interested in motion capture because it's not as interesting work. It kind of takes a lot of the creativity away from the animator. Like, rather than getting to animate a thing yourself and kind of come up with it, you are given a mostly kind of finished realistic looking animation and told to just clean it up or make it look like 10% better or something. But yeah, for some situations it is just the best tool for the job. Motion capture is really good for getting realistic animation done in bulk, basically. Like if you're making a game and you're trying to make it look photo real and you just need a ton of animations, it is going to be way faster and cheaper to just put somebody capable in a suit and have them act all that stuff out and then just have a bunch of animators clean that stuff up later than having them build all that stuff from scratch like it would take way longer to do that so yeah like for some jobs motion capture is great it is the best tool available in some games characters snap from one animation to the next while in others they appear to flow freely between animations from pretty much any frame what kind of tech is involved in that uh, i couldn't give you a very technical answer to this because i'm not super technical myself but uh, most animation engines have the ability to blend between animations somewhat freely. It won't do it in a smart way. The computer is basically just figuring out, okay, where is this animation supposed to be at this point and this other animation is supposed to be at this point and I'm just gonna linearly blend from one to the next like a crossfade. It won't look super natural in most cases, but it's a really useful tool. Like say, I could, I could just put in a walk cycle animation and a run cycle animation and hook them up in such a way that the computer can basically blend pretty nicely between the walk and the run so I can have a character like start running and then slow down to a walk and start running again, slow down to a walk. And I mean, that's a really cool ability. Not all games have that. Maybe they don't have it for performance reasons or maybe they don't have it for like gameplay reasons. But yeah, it's a useful tool, blending. How do different frame rates, or variable frame rates, affect how you animate? You are one of several people who ask questions about frame rates, so hopefully I can answer kind of most of you here with this one. Variable frame rates are not a huge concern to me when I'm animating, because like when I animate in a 3D package like Maya or 3ds Max or whatever you're using, I am animating at a constant frame rate. I'm treating frames as a unit of measure, so I will be animating at 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second or whatever the case. And the nice thing is that if things are all set up right, 
when I export my animation and put it into the game, the game is going to play that animation back properly, no matter what frame rate it's running at. If it is running at a crazy high frame rate, it may be doing some interpolation to kind of calculate the in-betweens between the frames that I animated. Like, say, if I animated something at 30 frames per second and the game's running at 60 frames per second, the timing should stay the same. Where frame rate does become a concern for the animator is when higher frame rates happen to smooth out or kind of soften the animations you make. Uh, generally, as I understand it, you kind of want to animate in your 3D package at the same frame rate that your game is generally targeting. Because an animation that looks really good at 30 frames per second may look not quite right at 60 frames per second, especially if it's meant to be like a really sharp, quick movement. Like a punch that looks really good at 30 frames per second, when you're seeing that smoothed out at crisp 60 frames per second, it may kind of feel softened, like your eye is seeing a few more frames in that punching motion, and it just makes it feel a little bit softer and less snappy. So in that particular case, I would want to really be getting in there as an animator and carefully watching the spacing for every one of those 60 frames per second or whatever. That's a long way of saying that it mostly doesn't matter until it kind of does. <laughs> Okay. How do you get the stop frame of running animation right? Like, if you look at Dragon Age Inquisition stop frames, like every time the character stops, it looks rushed and just wrong. Okay, so I, I'm assuming you're talking about, like, when a character is running full speed in a game, and you stop pressing forward, and the character just instantly snaps, like, pops to standing perfectly still and upright, like they've been standing still this whole time. Like, completely losing all inertia, and it just feels really aphysical, and I, I know what you're talking about. So... Usually the best way to solve that is with a combination of blends, like I was talking about earlier, and handmade custom animations to give the character the feeling of stopping suddenly and then, like, standing upright. Just a little transitional animation. Uh, the tricky thing is, like, usually a real person, if they were running full speed and then stopping, would need to kind of take a few steps to slow down. But in a game, you can't really do that because the player wanted the character to stop at that exact point. That's why they stopped pressing forward. And if the character keeps running for a few steps, they may run off the cliff that the player was trying to avoid or something. So it's a tricky situation where the player wants the character to stop immediately, even though for animation that looks weird. So you usually, as an animator, have to find ways to kind of fudge it and make it look kind of okay, even though it is an unnaturally quick stop. What are the key differences in video game and movie animations? And which one has taken bigger leaps to be better at it in recent years? Uh, boy, there are a lot of differences between video game and movie animation. I, I guess mostly in terms of working in video games or movies, maybe not in, like, how the result looks. Uh, movie animation tends to be held to a much higher standard of polish. Uh, you need to make that animation look as perfect as possible if you are working in film, which usually also means that you are given more time to make that animation look that good. Like, uh, Working in games, I generally am working at a much faster rate because I have so much more quantity that I have to crank out. Uh, movie animation also has the benefit of being animated to a camera that is the same every single time. So you as the animator know where the camera is and you can animate something to look really good from that one camera angle without having to worry about how it looks from any other angle. Whereas in games, the player might have control of the camera so you don't have that luxury. But there are, I could probably go on for a long time talking about differences. Maybe I will sometime in another video. But uh, in terms of which one has taken bigger leaps to be better in recent years, I would say definitely video game animation, mostly just by virtue of how much uh, gaming hardware has improved in the last decade, two decades, for as long as games have been around, basically. Like, film animation has improved too, but the fact that gaming consoles and PCs have grown so much more powerful allows game animators to do a lot more stuff in real time to a much greater degree of fidelity than we used to be able to, so it's just a much more visible improvement. Could you do an episode on the evolution of accurate mouth movements and voice syncing during cutscenes? Uh, I'm not planning to do a video, like, specifically focused on just that, but I do have a lot of animation episodes planned in the future that are definitely going to touch on that. After I'm done with this 12 Principles series of uh, games, I'm planning to move on to do all the numbered Final Fantasy games in chronological order, and it's definitely going to come up for that. And also for several other series that I've got planned after that, which will probably come out after that. What, in your opinion, is the best way to start animating? It just so happens that there is an extra credits episode coming out pretty soon-ish, maybe in the next couple weeks, that will hopefully be able to answer that pretty thoroughly. So I will just say wait until that episode comes out. Until then, if you haven't already, go pick up 
just this one book called The Animator's Survival Kit by Richard Williams. It is a book that contains basically all of the foundational principles of animation in it and just really gives you an idea of how the craft works. Pretty much every animator I know is aware of that book and probably owns it. So if you're just getting started, just trying to kind of figure out how animation works, uh, pick that book up. When you animate something, do you take pride in the fact that it looks so natural that most people won't even think about the work that went into it? Uh, hmm. I mean, yes, I do take pride in, uh, like, when I animate something that just really looks and feels right. And, like, even though no one will probably really notice just because it looks and feels right, so they'll just think, oh yeah, that looks cool. But honestly, I think the most, like, satisfying thing for me as an animator is when I see a shot or an animation having the effect that I was trying to get, or like getting the reaction from an audience that I was aiming for. If it was meant to be funny, if it makes people laugh, that feels super awesome. Or if people just really respond to something like looking cool or cute or whatever else, and, and that's what you were going for, that feels super cool as an animator, so yeah. In your job as an animator, do they just tell you what the character needs to do and do you run free, or are they specific down to the details? This largely depends on the job, and the workplace, and the uh, directors you're working under. Like, I've worked on some projects where the director was very particular and had a kind of complete idea of what they wanted the film to be in their head already, so I could propose my own ideas, but they already kind of had an idea of what they wanted, so my job was largely to give them what they were already kind of envisioning in their head. But I've also worked on projects where I had total creative freedom and could just run completely hog wild, do whatever I wanted. I honestly don't know which one I like better. I kind of like a... I think I kind of favor a middle ground between having some direction, but then being allowed to take that direction and run with it, as opposed to just having to come up with something completely from scratch. I don't know. I have I feel like I've worked at both extreme ends of that spectrum, and I can't really decide which I prefer. Why is it so difficult to realistically animate something that in real life would be easy to accomplish? Uh, pretty much for the same reason that it's way harder to realistically paint a landscape than it is to look at one. Are you working on any projects lately that you are free to discuss? Nope. On your latest game project, did you find the animation as fulfilling as working on a traditional animated production? Huh. That's a good question. In some ways, yes, I would say that working in games has been equally fulfilling, partially just because I'm learning so much. Like, animating for games is such a complicated thing just because there's so much tech involved and making all these animations work together and flow together and figuring out how to make them both look good and feel good to the player. And just, just, there's so much learning that I still have to do. I feel like, like I've been working in games for like, I guess like two-ish, three years now, and I still feel like I barely know anything at this point. One thing I do miss from film animation though is that like, when you're animating a film, the entire emphasis is on crafting a performance and making a character act. Like, with games, you'll be animating all kinds of physical things that the character just has to be able to do in a game, like running or jumping or attacking or just every single possible thing that the character might end up doing. Whereas with film, it's kind of nice being able to just get into a character's head and act through that character. And... It, I don't know, it's it's a different kind of experience. I really am enjoying both, but I am finding that I don't have nearly as many opportunities to get into that kind of acting mindset with game animation, which is a little sad, but it comes with its own cool, interesting problems to solve too. So I don't know, they're both good. What principle of animation is the most difficult to get looking just right? Hmm. That probably varies from animator to animator. I think everybody's got their strengths. I find timing pretty challenging. I feel like getting really good at timing is like the artist's equivalent of getting good at drawing a perfect circle. Like you can be a really good artist, but drawing a perfect circle is still really, really impossibly difficult. And I think timing is a thing that you just get better and better at, but never really master. So yeah, I would say timing, but I'm sure other animators would probably give you a different principle that is their own struggle. How do you streamline your workflow so that you don't get overwhelmed with the amount of content that you gotta create? I feel as though with each new thing that gets completed, something else needs to get made. I totally feel you on that. My method, which works for me, I don't, mileage may vary, but my method is usually to create 
lists of everything that needs to get done, and then kind of create sublists for each of those, and then just write that sublist down on a sticky note so that's the only thing I have to look at, so I can just focus on that smaller task until it is done, then move on to the next thing, break it into smaller tasks, just get that on a sticky note. My desk tends to be pretty darn covered with sticky notes, but it, it really helps for me to be able to just focus on a smaller task for a little while, get that out of the way, not stress out about the whole larger scope of the thing, and then move on. And yeah, it does end up constantly feeling like, all right, I finished this, now here's the next thing, now here's the next thing, now here's the next thing, and you're just doing that forever. But, I mean, that's just the nature of big projects, really. How important do you think motion capture will become as technology improves, and should keyframe animators like me be worried? I kind of already talked about motion capture, so I won't get into that again. But I don't think that keyframe animators need to be all that worried, because even though motion capture may become an increasingly large, prominent part of the animation job market, and that probably doesn't sound super fun for a lot of animators. Like I said before, it's a good tool for certain jobs and a bad tool for other ones, and those other jobs still need to be done. So keyframe animators for the foreseeable future, I think can rest easy because I think our skill set is going to be needed for a while yet. Probably forever, because I mean, motion capture is not going to get you Jack and Daxter, I'll tell you that. 2D or 3D animation, what's better for emotional games? Both. All. Yes. And both of them are completely capable of powerful emotional impact. I'm sure you have seen both 2D and 3D animated films that have just really got you emotionally, so yeah, equally capable. Could you show an animation network? I think not everyone would be familiar with that, but a lot of what you're talking about uses those networks to make it work. Like, if you can show states with their transitions and blends, as well as that there can be multiple states active at once, that would give everyone a common basis of understanding. Also, thanks for the videos. Uh, Il K. Shipper, I'm sorry. A gameplay programmer working on Horizon Zero Dawn. Oh, sweet. Okay. I am looking forward to your game. Good luck with that. I can't wait. Um... Can I show an animation network? Okay, I can... I'm gonna find some images on the internet, and I'm gonna put them up right now, and I'm guessing this is probably not going to make any sense to almost all of you, and that's okay, because just glancing at it, it doesn't make a ton of sense to me either. And now that I think of it, I should really bring in a tech animator one of these days, or a tech artist, to explain this stuff because it is very complicated. I am only just learning it myself, but it is incredibly important for understanding how animation, like, actually works and triggers and blends and all that stuff in a game, so... I will think on that. Eventually, I will try to get a tech artist in here to explain it better than I can. Could you do an episode about Shovel Knight or Undertale's pixel art? I think both are interesting examples of pixel art. Undertale in particular is so varied within the same exact title. I will definitely be talking about pixel art at some point. I mean, the Final Fantasy series I mentioned is gonna be pixel art for the first six games, so... Um, one of the problems I am worried about running into is that I have not personally worked in pixel art before or done any, not even like in school. I've tried to do some research and talk to other pixel artists to gain a better understanding of how pixel art and pixel animation works. So I will try to do my research for these so I can give you a semi-informed explanation of how all this stuff works. But um, it's not something I've done myself, so that, yeah. And I don't know, I actually hadn't considered Shovel Knight or Undertale, but... I mean, the list of games that I'm intending to eventually get to is long, so I don't see any reason why I can't add those to the list, because I like both of those games a lot. Do you know any resources for studying game animations and animations in general? Really, the best source that I use, anyway, is just getting video footage on my computer in QuickTime or some other player that is capable of going frame by frame, and just really getting in there, going frame by frame, and analyzing how that animation worked, and just really breaking it down. Hey Dan, how many animators are usually needed for big AAA games? I'm actually almost shocked to realize I don't know. Because I know how big my animation team is, but... I mean, I don't work at a huge AAA developer, necessarily, and I actually don't know the answer to this. I will have to ask around. And finally, last question today, if you had to tier what you think is the easiest type of animation to the hardest, how would you rank it? I always considered stuff like cut paper and stop motion probably the top of the difficulty chart, but since you have professional experience, how would you place them? I would probably do the same thing. Maybe stop motion animators don't feel the same way, but stop motion definitely feels like the hardest to me, because it's something that you have to get right beginning to end or start over. 
<laughs> I mean, it, like you have to do so much planning and figure out the timing and all that stuff just so well in your head before you even start getting into executing it. And gosh, just like bumping a light or something once could screw up like hours of work you've already done. And like, even to me, an animator, stop motion animation feels like insane. I don't understand how they do it. I would then rank traditional hand-drawn 2D animation probably close to that. I have done some of that myself, but I'm not a terribly great draftsman, like I can't draw super well. I can draw kind of okay, but definitely not well enough to be a 2D animator. But uh, yeah, that has always seemed pretty challenging to me as well. A other than that, I honestly don't know. Like there's the kind of 2D animation that works like with Flash and other kinds of programs that's sort of a hybrid CG 2D animation field which seems like to me it would be a little bit easier but maybe that's just because i cg 3d animation is the one i know and i don't even know where pixel animation fits into that spectrum of difficulty it seems really challenging to me but that's because i still am just kind of learning how it works so i don't know let's just all agree that stop motion is insane so anyway, yes, thank you guys very much for your questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them. There were so many. Um, if you would like to ask a question to possibly appear in a future episode, I'll put a link right up here in the video. Ding. Or if not in the video, then down in the description, because maybe I didn't figure out how to put it in the video. But anyway, you can ask a question there, and I may answer it in a future one if I do more of these. Let me know if you guys liked this, by the way, if this is uh, interesting and fun for you guys. If not, then I will just use this effort to try to crank out the animation videos a little faster and not do these Q&A videos. But I figured you guys might like this. I don't know. Let me know. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your questions. I will see you guys again soon with another animation video, hopefully. So see you then.